On a visit to a Hawaiian volcano, a tourist loses his way. I made a grave error and I was really in trouble. In this vast, unforgiving environment, there's no chance of finding help. Guys, come on! To make it out alive, he must figure out how to cope before his mind and body give up. I was exhausted and injured. Fear that I may not survive this started settling in. His only companion, a camcorder. I want you to know I'll always be with you, always be watching over you. This could be the last time my kids hear my voice. I really love you guys. Bye. The 41-year-old Dewey Gadke is adjusting to life after divorce. This holiday in Hawaii is one of the first he's taken without his family. When I went over there, I really feel like my life was in a, a transition. I went through a, a painful, difficult divorce, and I was in the midst of a bunch of change. Everything felt new in many ways. I, I think I was uh, taking things less seriously and becoming much more um, uh, exploratory, much more curious. Dewey's hoping that a week exploring the majestic scenery of Big Island will help him come to terms with the past and plan the future. That is amazing. Like every tourist, the must-see highlight of Dewey's trip to Hawaii is the spectacular Kilauea volcano. one of the most active volcanoes on the planet. It's set in 300,000 acres of barren lava fields. Devoted father, Dewey, badly misses his two young daughters, Trina, aged five, and Tara, seven, who live with their mother. Hey, Trina, Tara, it's your dad. This is the Kilauea volcano I was telling you guys about. His kids couldn't come with him, so he's filming his holiday to share with them on his return. Ain't she amazing? And tonight, you will see her in her full fury. More later. But this trip to Kilauea is just a scout. Dewey plans to come back after dark when the volcano looks even more dramatic. My friends had told me that viewing of the volcano was much better at night because you can't see the lava in the bright sunlight. I didn't expect to be out there very long, um, but the, the lady at the front desk said, well, it's, it's very dark, you should at least buy a flashlight to take with you. So I, I put on jeans, uh, good walking shoes, uh, a T-shirt. I put my video camera in a waterproof case that I, that, that I brought with me, and then I bought a flashlight, and that was, uh, that was my preparation for the trip. Dewey doesn't pack a compass or bottled water for his nighttime trip. He expects to reach the volcano in a couple of hours and be back in his room soon after midnight. I left the hotel and drove in this old road that goes into the national park. Uh, 10, 15 mile drive. It's fairly desolate. And then the road just dead ends. Way off in the distance, I could see the very, very faint glow of orange, of the actual molten lava. It was at that moment I started realizing that I had to be careful to get back to my car because there was no light on the car, there was no street lamps, nothing to identify the road. 
but the moon was giving off a good bit of light, so I thought I'd be okay. I was prepared for a very short hike. The only two things I was carrying was a flashlight and my video camera, and there's no cell coverage down there. So I didn't even bother to take my cell phone. Dewey is confident he'll find his way back to the car, but he's failed to factor in the unfamiliar terrain and total lack of landmarks. I was just skipping from mound to mound, and there was a, a breeze. I felt great. It was a really, really pretty night. But after two hours, Dewey is still a long way from the distant glow of flowing lava. I was like, uh, that orange glow doesn't seem much closer than it did an hour ago. Uh, this seems quite a bit farther than they had told me. I thought about uh, uh, blowing it off, but uh, I was pretty committed to actually seeing it and having the experience, so I didn't do that. After a three-hour hike, Dewey reaches one of Kilauea's active vents. Here, molten lava pours spectacularly into the sea and solidifies, making Big Island a little bigger every day. The steam and the sense of the ocean and the boiling water was just immense. To stand next to this and just realize what a what a small piece uh, of, of this planet I am was, was, was humbling. It was phenomenal. So I took my video camera out and I started filming it. Uh, and I really wanted to get closer to it, but I kept, based on my friends telling me that it runs under the ground and there's a thin crust and all this, I kept feeling the ground as I got closer and it got very, very hot. I, I was afraid it would melt my shoes and I was afraid I could break through. And so I didn't get as close as I wanted, but it was really fascinating. Hey girls, it's your dad. Those lights in the distance, that's the lava flows crashing. <laughs> I kind of doubt you can see anything. It's uh, sort of like the landscape of the moon. It's the roughest. Hardest terrains I've ever seen. <coughs> That's it right there, girls. New Earth being created. It's a beautiful thing. I watched the volcano for probably 20, 25 minutes, and then I was like, it's got to be late, and it's going to be very late when I get back to my car, so it's time to get headed back. But when Dewey looks for the trail he came in on, he can't find it. Undaunted, he decides to follow the coastline and then cut inland to hit the road where he'd parked his car. That was the plan. But just after Dewey sets out. The moon went down, or clouds came over. Basically, it got quite a bit darker. I think I was walking in less of a straight line. Surprisingly quickly, I hit a different texture of rock. Um, it was, uh, and I didn't know what it was, but instead of being this smooth, crunchy, black dough, it was these large, white, crumbling boulders, and incredibly hard to walk on that stuff. If my thinking had been clear, I think I would have noticed that I've somehow moved to a different uh, topography, a different geography. Something's changed here. But I just didn't know if this was some strange, I'd seen so many strange formations and strange things the lava had done that didn't occur to me that, that this was a bad sign. Three hours later, 
Dewey thinks he's hugged the coast long enough. By his calculations, he should be only minutes from his car. Okay, that's gotta be enough. At the point I thought I've gotta be past the end of the road, I turned left to walk inland, expecting to hit the road in my car. That's where things started going badly. Dewey's taking a terrible gamble. If he misses his car in the darkened moonscape, he'll be heading deep into 300,000 acres of uninhabited volcanic fields. There was no trail at all. I'm just walking across raw, unmarked lava flows. After three hours hiking inland, there's still no sign of his car. Dewey realizes he's lost. I'm just scared. I'm really scared. Hungry, thirsty, and all alone, he feels a desperate urge to talk to someone, even if it's only his camcorder. Well, it's getting late, and uh, I'm dehydrated and lost. I had a plan to uh, head up the coast and uh, cut across the road. Obviously, the road's a lot further than I thought. But he's confident that with the dawn, he'll be able to find his car. When the sun comes up, I can see just this vast area. The lava seems to go on forever. Dewey thought that daylight would help him regain his bearings. Instead, he's confronted with an alien, featureless landscape. With no mobile phone, he has no way to call for help. I didn't see any signs of humanity at all. Very um, alone out there, very alone. Although he doesn't know it, Dewey walked right past his car during the night. Now he's walking headlong into 300,000 acres of empty lava fields. Dewey breaks out his camcorder. Recording a video diary for his daughters at least gives him someone to talk to. Well, uh, I can't find the road. I've uh, circled, I've... I must have walked five, six miles of absolute hell. I just can't work out how you get to this spot without having crossed the road. I don't think I'll be hiking without a compass again. Heading inland looking for the road, I ended up walking on some stuff that was really, really dangerous to walk on. These are crispy shells like overcooked cookies, and every time you step on them, they break. And you fall into these holes of crumbly shards of glass-like rock. A shard of volcanic rock has ripped Dewey's arm open. I sliced a vein and uh, a lot of blood came out. It was really frightening. Dewey has nothing to bandage his wound with. Instead, he clamps it with his hand and hopes the bleeding will stop. I was exhausted and injured and been walking all night, been falling. Uh, scraped and cut. Physically, uh, was not in good shape at that point. There. Pretty dumb, huh? Well, I just want you guys to know that I'm uh, working really hard to get back to you. Well, this is what I've been walking on all night. It's, uh, the roughest, nastiest terrain I've uh, ever walked on. 
miles and miles and miles of this stuff. As far as the eye can see. Really nasty terrain. Dewey now knows that one more accident and his situation could quickly change from bad to critical. Worse, it looks as though he's still miles from safety. I didn't see any signs of, of humanity at all. Uh, very vast, very um, alone out there, very alone. Shortly after noon that first day, I really started seeing my thinking go bad. I would get confused that I was seeing terrain I'd seen before. I started wondering if I was walking in circles. I don't think my mind was working that well. I can't explain it, but at least for the first several hours of the day, I remained very stubbornly, foolishly attached to this idea that the road was ahead of me. But then, do we hear something? I had a helicopter coming straight toward me. If Dewey's hotel reported him missing, this could be a search helicopter. Hey! Over here! Hey! Guys! But he has only seconds to try and get noticed. A mirror attached to his camera bag may be his salvation. Come on, guys. You can see me. Come on. There was this grand fantasy that they would see my flickering mirror and come down and pick me up and fly me out and we'd all go get breakfast. Hey! Over here! Hey! But you know, it wasn't playing out that way. When I was out on the lava rock, I was struck by how barren of life it was. There wasn't anything anywhere. No, no animal life that I saw, except for birds. And then something hit my leg, and I looked down, and it was a wire. This was the first sign of any sign of humanity I'd seen since I'd been out there. It was like a speaker wire. I traced it back and found a metal plate with reflector, like you'd see on the back of a bicycle. My mirror's not working, and, and I'm not getting seen. If I use this wire and these reflectors and make a belt and wear it, it might make me a little more visible. Dewey is bitterly regretting his decision not to bring any water from the hotel. And as the temperature soars beyond 30 Celsius, the furnace-like heat of the lava fields is making him dangerously dehydrated. He's now feeling dizzy and nauseous. Mine's working that well. My priority switched. I stopped looking for the road. I started looking for water. Surrounded by dust and rock, it seems like a futile task. But astonishingly, over the next ridge, his luck finally changes. Dewey spots an oasis, which must mean water. The landscape's incredibly barren, incredibly open, and then there are these little oases of very dense jungle springing up. All of this walking I'd been doing, I'd never seen even a tiny puddle, and so I started crawling into these jungles, hoping to find some water. 
Inside the uh, jungle, the, the, the variety of plant life is just unbelievable. There's trees, there's grasses, there's palms, there's everything you can imagine. And they're growing so closely together, you can't even see or touch the floor. You just, you just bend them over into this suspended net of plants and crawl on top of them. But just as Dewey gets his first taste of water in nearly 12 hours, Like the first helicopter, it doesn't appear to notice him. Come on! Throughout the day, several more helicopters pass overhead. Over here! But none of them sees him. Dewey starts to realize that they aren't search and rescue helicopters, but are carrying tourists on sightseeing trips to the volcano. Mad with thirst, he's torn between trying to attract their attention and finding life-saving water. At that point, I started doing schizophrenic back and forth. And I would crawl as fast as I could to get out where I could reflect the mirror at them. And then as soon as that didn't work and they were gone, I'd crawl back in again to try to find moisture. <laughs> Guys! Come on! I was really operating in very much a, a panicked way that was just, it was burning up everything I had. And then I look down and the beads of sweat on my arm are, are as big as the, the drops I'm uh, getting. So I'm exerting way more energy and water and moisture than I am actually uh, getting moisture. I flashed my mirror at probably um, 12 helicopters today, and um, not one acknowledged me. I don't think anyone's looking for me. At that point, I started to get really afraid. I can't do two things at once. I need to find water. I'm going to make it for at least a year without a helicopter, but I'm not going to make it another day without water. In the small oasis, plants are thriving. But Dewey can only find beads of moisture, not nearly enough to satisfy his raging thirst. I see this very large drop of water. I'm leaning over to try to reach it, and as I do, I'm supporting myself uh, from falling by pushing on the edge of a tree with my left hand. And I was like, something feels strange. And there's a green moss growing on the side of the tree. I tore some of it off and squeezed it. A trickle of water ran out. I did uh, hold the water in my mouth as a test to see if there was anything acidy or burning that, that, that felt like it might be poisonous. It looks like Dewey's in luck, but he needs to collect more than just a mouthful. My flashlight batteries were dead. I threw them away and I started squeezing this moss into the handle of my flashlight. It wasn't exactly, you know, clean, delicious water, but I was pretty happy that I'd actually found it. That gave me some confidence. Uh, it improved my, improved my thinking and my sense of hope. 
I don't think I was uh, completely dancing for joy yet, but I was, uh, I was encouraged. I actually had found a source of water. That was the life-saving moment for me. This amazing green moss has furnished me with a flashlight full of delicious muddy water. Muddy water never tasted so good. The small oasis has saved Dewey's life, for now. But he knows that if anyone is looking for him, his best chance of being rescued is out in the open. In fact, Dewey's hotel has raised the alarm and an air search and rescue is now on. But spotting a tiny figure in nearly 300,000 acres of featureless terrain is like looking for a needle in a haystack. As a second night on the volcano approaches, and temperatures begin to plummet, Dewey realizes he must find somewhere to shelter. I felt like I had to find a warmer place because I couldn't sit out in the wind and get any sleep. I found this crack that just went straight down into the earth. It wasn't even a cave, it was kind of a fissure. And I crawled down into there but it was very frightening, incredibly crumbly. And I was really concerned that if, you know, if I just bumped to the wall in the wrong way, this thing could cave in on me. I was just nervous about it, but I felt like I had to be out of the wind because the wind had, the wind had gotten stronger and it was getting chillier. Dewey now faces the grim hours ahead knowing that at any moment, his shelter could become his grave. It was straight down into the ground. <laughs> Exhausted and despairing, Dewey is now regretting leaving the safety and shelter of the oasis. All he can do is pray he can survive till morning. Dewey can see no way out of his predicament. Hungry, dehydrated and demoralized, his video messages are becoming increasingly desperate. In the beginning, the camera was really the solace to me. It was comforting to actually have something to talk to. Kids, uh, hi. It's your dad again. But by the third day, some real um, grounded, fear that I, I may not survive this started settling in. I'm so sorry to let you down, but I am, uh, I'm in real trouble here. Um, truth be told, I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. Dewey's beginning to think that he may not make it out alive. He's chronically dehydrated, and his body is close to collapse. At this point, I'm really not walking well. My balance is off, my leg's injured. I had this sprained ankle that I'd turned, you know, three or four times. I was really sick of turning that. I had so many cuts and blisters and things going on in my feet. 
felt like if I keep walking on these rocks, collapsing and falling, now I'm gonna break a leg and die. <sighs> You're gonna kill yourself with this, Dewey. Dewey needs to get water, and soon. That means finding another oasis. In temperatures approaching 40 Celsius, his body is losing over three liters of fluid a day and Dewey's brain is starting to suffer the effects of serious dehydration. I don't know that I can articulate exactly how dehydration felt. A fuzzy, unclear way of thinking. Thinking I'm walking in circles. Dry mouth seeing things. But Dewey isn't seeing things. He's found water just in time. Dewey decides to change his plan. Instead of trying to escape the volcano, he'll stay at the water source and pray that someone rescues him. My idea was, yeah, if I can learn to survive, I can make it as long as I have to. Dewey hasn't eaten in 37 hours. He's starving, but has no idea what's edible and what might be poisonous. One thing I had been doing is testing some foods to see if they made me sick and see if they were edible. So if I had to stay there for a long time, I would have an idea of what I could eat to survive. Starving and exhausted, Dewey desperately needs a good night's rest to regain his strength. So I figured I'd better come up with a way to shelter myself. Dewey's life in the city hasn't prepared him for this. So he must dig deep and develop survival skills. found some reeds that I could bend into a dome shape and shove them into the mud, and then pile stuff on top. But that afternoon, I made a rudimentary little hut that I could crawl into. It was very, very flimsy. Proud of his achievements, Dewey decides to tell his daughters. Hey, Trina, Tara. You always said you wanted a vacation home, so here it is. I just built this shelter, and I'm hoping it's going to help me survive. These leaves here, they're going to help me collect water. In the night, rain begins to fall. A light shower could fill his leaf collectors with life-saving water. But this isn't a shower. The worst thing about the whole time out there was the nights. The wind cut right through my shelter, and it was just absolutely freezing. It was not well insulated. I hadn't put a door on it. Being in the wind and the rain and bugs crawling on me and not being able to move because I'd knocked down my shelter. That was the hardest thing for me. 
I shivered the whole night, and it wasn't a mild shiver. I shivered like deep muscle shiver. The storm has trashed his shelter and overturned his rain catches. The third morning, the hunger had set in, the isolation had set in. I'd been shivering all night. I was exhausted. I was injured. I was sore. There was a lot of hopelessness. To make matters worse, Dewey now makes a shocking discovery. I had all these shards of, of pumice or lava rock or whatever it is embedded in my feet. <laughs> there was some pussiness to it, and there was kind of a reddish line, and it was really sore. Just a constant swollen pressure inside of it. <clears throat> That's when my idea that I can sit this out, it fell apart. I thought, well, I can sit it out unless I've got gangrene or unless I've got some infection. It felt really real. You know, it felt really right up against the edge of, of existence at that, that point. After more than 51 hours alone, and with no one to share his ordeal, Dewey's turning to his camera more and more. I hope you guys are proud of me. I ain't no quitter. I ain't no quitter. I, uh, I got my reflector valve up in the tree. But, uh, as you can see, it ain't doing me no good. <laughs> Looks like it's just you and me. Unknown to Dewey, search and rescue helicopters are out looking for him. In the night, local police have found his Jeep. But after three days scouring 300,000 acres of volcanic fields, they're starting to think he hasn't survived. By morning, Dewey's hit rock bottom, and the infection in his foot is spreading. The pain is excruciating. Any remaining hopes Dewey had of walking off the volcano are gone. Uh, my uh, foot is uh, pretty badly blistered, and uh, I'm pussing. Seem to find me. His only hope is to make one final attempt to attract the passing tourist helicopters. Well, I thought if I could build a fire, a large fire with a lot of smoke, um, might actually attract rescuers. Dewey decides that the lava fields which have held him hostage for five days might give him an escape route. If he can use the red-hot lava to ignite a branch, he can start a fire and make a beacon. But to do it, 
Dewey must brave the volcano's toxic gases. Even brief exposure to concentrated carbon dioxide could kill him. crawled down into one of these volcanic vents and tried to stick a long branch down into where it seemed like it was a hot area. After just a few minutes choking in the intense heat and smoke, Dewey realizes he's taking a suicidal risk. There were fumes coming out of there, and I was afraid I was going to pass out. It's a bitter blow. Tourist helicopters continue to fly by, and Dewey still has no way of attracting their attention. came to the conclusion the only way I'm going to be able to get a fire is if I can get a magnifying glass uh, to amplify the sun onto some leaves. The only place I could think to get a magnifying glass was the lens inside of my video camera. The camera was always my companion, someone to talk to, my connection to the outside in a way. Talking to it every day was a, was a solace to me. It was comforting, so I didn't want to smash it. Before destroying the only companion he's had, Dewey decides to record one final message to his daughters. I was thinking, you know, this, this, this could be the last time my kids hear my voice. My name is Dewey Gerke, and this is my final will and testament. Realizing how much pain I'm putting my family through, and I just want to say, guys, I'm sorry I was stupid and reckless. I was feeling for my kids if they had to grow up, you know, without me. Trina and Tara, if I don't make it back, guys, I am so sorry. I want you to know I'll always be with you, always be watching over you. a pretty emotional process of, of saying goodbye. If this is my time and place, it's a really beautiful place. But I'm going to do my best to get back to you guys. I'm not quitting. I really love you guys. Bye. But Dewey does have one slim hope. He thinks that if he can extract the glass lens from inside his beloved video camera, he may just be able to start a fire with it. I understood that I was taking that film out, putting it in a waterproof case and hanging it on the tree for someone else to find, for somebody to find after I was dead. Dewey feels that his camera is the one thing that's kept him sane. Destroying it is almost more than he can bear. But I figured I, I needed to. I needed to, you know, make the hard choice and, and, and try to find a way to stay alive. To get to the lens, he has to smash the camera. The problem is, he risks smashing the lens too. I got some big rocks and started trying to break my camera open. The lens just won't come loose. If I hit it too hard with too big of a rock, I would have crushed the glass, and it was just a, a painful effort. I 
for the helicopter. But it's yet another tourist group checking out the volcano, not looking for him. I decided, well, they're ignoring me. There's no point in getting up and flashing my mirror. But it flew right over to me, and I was like, is it possible that they actually saw me this time? And uh, started circling me, and it was at that moment that I totally knew they saw me. Incredibly, one of the tourists was able to capture on camera the moment of Dewey's discovery. Yeah, he needs help. He's waving you down. And it was at that moment I just, I, I really started crying. I was alive after five days. huge kind of release of all the fear and all the um, desperation I've been I've been kind of keeping somewhat at bay and it all came busting forth and I just sat on the ground and I cried and I shook nearly 90 hours after his ordeal began Dewey was airlifted to hospital where he was treated for his injuries and severe dehydration. Four days later, he returned home to Austin, Texas, to be reunited with his daughters. Absolutely the biggest thing behind my will to live uh, was my kids, wanting to get back to them and not wanting them to have to grow up without a father. Dewey owed his life to the young inquisitive tourist who spotted him, Peter Frank. He said, thanks a lot, you saved my life. And then he asked me for my home phone number and stuff. And what did you say? I said, it's cool. Peter has remained in touch with Dewey, Trina, and Terra ever since. <laughs>